What's going on, Jaywalkers? Happy New Year. I can't believe we've made it. I can't believe how fast this year has actually gone by. It blows my mind, one, how much you can do in a year, but also how fast a year actually goes. I think I was just talking about it in a message before. Just as you get older, at least for me, as I get older, time just seems to go faster and faster and faster. And so here we are. It's the very beginning of 2023. I actually can't believe it falls on a Sunday so you guys can listen to this literally the first day of the new year. Uh, some of you in Australia, it's probably like, I don't know, nighttime already by the time you're listening to this, but that's besides the point. Every, it's for the first, it's the first day for everybody. And it's New Year's, but we are in a different spot. I don't know if you can see it. It's a Jaywalkers sign, which is pretty awesome. Uh, it's a themed message now. And uh, I don't know, this message I kind of wanted to just talk about, really what I love to do is, um, Sometimes we get words for the year and that's just kind of a word that we've been praying about that's going to carry us into the year that we're going to study, that we're going to think on, that God's going to reveal more and more stuff to us about that word. But one thing that I really like to do is have a verse for the year or uh, for me this year, it's really a chapter. Um, it's, it's where the location of one of my favorite verses of the Bible is at. And uh, I'm going to get my Bible here in a second. We're going to talk about it. But we're going to be going through the entire chapter of Philippians chapter 3. It's one of my favorite uh, books in the Bible. But it's also a landing place for one of my favorite locations to read in the Bible when it comes to Philippians chapter 3. But just some context to what's happening in, in the book of Philippians. Number one, uh, Philippians, the, the, the Philippians or the church of Philippi, is the first church that ever partnered with Paul on his ministry journey. And so with that comes friendship, comes camaraderie, and a deep place of love. Paul loves the Philippians. He loves this church. They're the, his first partner. And just the, the way he writes and the way that he talks and the way that you hear his voice through these, these words in this chapter, it's very different from the narrative that you hear in other letters. He loves this church. He loves the Philippians. He loves these people. And so through this, it's, it's a letter where he expresses his love, his gratitude, and his partnership with these, with these Philippians. But it's also the, under, the underlying focus of this book, but really this chapter, is a deep focus on God. And so we're going we're gonna to jump into that. Uh, it's kinda, I'm going to talk about three things that I really pulled from it and why it's really important to me and why this is going to be kind of my guiding chapter for this year of my life. And maybe it is for you too. Maybe you guys kind of take this with you, keep it in your arsenal, keep it in your belt, because I really believe that this chapter is going to empower you. It's going to strengthen you. It's going to act as a reminder of what's really important and who God really is in your life. So we're going to dive into that. I'm going to pray, then I'm going to go get my Bible. But God, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Thank you so much for an amazing year. Thank you so much for the way that you've revealed yourself to us through this year. God, I pray that you continue to do that in the next year. God, I pray that you continue to to grow our gifts, talents, and abilities, that you continue to grow and stir up a fire within us to learn about you, to get closer to you, to have a desire to know you. I pray that you walk closer than you've ever walked before. I pray that you show yourself in ways that you've never shown yourself before. God, we pray to see a move of God. We pray to see a move of you. So God, start a revival in each city that is under the sound of this voice right now. God, let your name be glorified. Let your name be honored. And God, let your, let your spirit just fall on your people. God, we want to see you move like you've never moved before. So God, we just ask for that. We pray for that. We pray for an amazing year. We pray that you are glorified, exemplified. And God, I pray that we walk out of here knowing something new about you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I don't know what it is, but every time I go up the stairs in my house, I am winded and out of breath. But other stairs are totally fine for me. But it's specifically these stairs they get me, but we're going to jump into it. I don't know how long this message is going to be. Um, I'm just kind of going where, where I feel led to, where I feel called to. And, uh, we're going to, we're going to jump into it, but I want to read Philippians chapter three really quick. And I'm reading in the ESV and we're going to start. So it says, finally, my brothers rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and it is safe for you. Basically what he's saying right here is that 
A lot of times it's kind of annoying when you have to go back and reiterate yourself and say the same thing over and over and over again. But Paul's really just opening up this chapter and this part of the letter with the idea that, you know, it's really no trouble for me at all. Like I actually find joy in going back and reminding you of things that will be safer and be better for you later on. So for me to go back and reiterate myself on these topics, it's no issue for me at all. So that's what he's saying. He goes on and he says, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers who look out, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. We're going to get to this. If anyone thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel on the tribe of Benjamin in the Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law of a Pharisee, as to zeal, as persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I gain, I had, I count as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth and knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but comes through the faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him and have the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings and become more like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain resurrection of the dead. So kind of to keep us moving forward, I'm not really going to talk about this first section too much, but just for the sake of understanding what Paul's talking about, so you have a understanding of what the Bible's saying and you're not kind of confused. Basically what he's saying when he's saying that I was circumcised on the eighth day, it's, it's acting in accordance to one of the laws that was in Leviticus. I think it was chapter two. Uh, he was raised from the tri tribe of Benjamin, so he is a Jew, right? But he's also a Roman right? And so he, he speaks both Roman and Jew. His parents were Hebrews of Hebrews. And that's kind of where you get that whole thing from. So he's saying, I'm more qualified than you. And basically when he says, I have more confidence in the flesh, it kind of comes from the idea that he was so well studied and well versed in the Old Testament. And he was such a scholar and so smart in those type of things. He's saying, I have more confidence in myself than, than you do. Like I know this stuff like the back of my hand. And we're gonna get more, um, we're gonna get more into who Paul is going into kind of the second point. But just so you kind of understand, he's basically setting himself apart from these people because of number one, his knowledge and his background, because he was both Roman and Jew. And so it's kind of confusing, but that's what, that's what he's, he's saying. He's basically saying I'm following the law and I can follow the law and I have more confidence in my flesh to follow the law than you. And because of that, I'm confident, right? But then he just defeats everything that he's going to say by going into the next part of us. So he's saying before Jesus, before any of that type of stuff and the law and all this, like I have more confidence in myself than you should because of who I am and because of what I know, if that makes sense. And we're going to get more into that in a little bit. We're going to keep going. Picking up in verse 12, and we're going to read to the end. Not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made, the, made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and straighting forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward calling of Christ, Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, now tell you, even with tears walk as enemies to the cross of Christ, and their end is destruction, and their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame, and their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship, citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies into be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. That is... Philippians 3, 
It's a lot, it's very theological, but it's also super practical and we're, we're gonna dissect it. We're gonna get into it and we're gonna break it down and we're gonna talk about everything and of why I want this to be my really chapter that marks the year for my life. I want this to kind of embody the things that I stand for, the things that I focus on, the things that I'm striving for, the thing that changes my decisions, that refocuses my mind, that empowers me to live out the call that God has on my life. I think all of that is really in this single chapter and it's really focused on the idea of focusing on God. And, um, and I really wanna jump into my first point, which is when Paul is talking that he counts everything as a loss. But before we talk about that, we really need to talk about who Paul was. Paul was a genius. Honestly, he was probably arguably the most influential person in the Bible, besides Jesus, of course. I think he might have been the most influential person in the Bible, writing two-thirds of the Old Testament. He was both Jew and he was also Roman. And so it's, it's kind of weird. He was born in a city called Tarsus, which is kind of like a Cambridge today. It was a university place. People that came from there were extremely well studied. Um, Paul was also a Pharisee who studied under Gamamiel, who would be like, stu studying under Gamamiel would be like studying physics under Stephen Hawking. Like he was that renowned, he was that smart. That's who Paul studied under. So he was also a Pharisee. Here's also a fun fact is that Jesus or, or God really never renamed Saul to Paul. Um, going back to the reason, Saul was both Roman and he was also Jew. One of them was his Roman name. The other one was his Jewish name. That's why you have Saul and you have Paul. He was never actually renamed. He just went with one of his names that he already had. But really the biggest thing about Paul is how crazy smart he was. He was super well studied. He knew the scripture. He knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand. He knew Jewish law and religion so well. And so Paul is stepping into this point in the narrative and he's saying that everything that I've ever attained, everything that I have, everything that I know, all of my knowledge, everything that I've studied for, I count it as a loss for the sake of knowing who Jesus is. He's saying that everything that I've attained, acquired, or gained for myself, it pales in comparison to knowing and truly knowing who Jesus is. That's how I want to live this next year. No matter what I gain for myself, no matter how much I, I put into my gifts, talents, and abilities, no matter where this life takes me, I never want to trade it for the idea of anything other than knowing who Jesus is on an intimate level. So Paul is stepping into this, this point of the story right here and he's being super candid, open, and honest saying, hey, I know all of this stuff. I've done all of this stuff, but it means nothing. The only thing of true value, the only thing of true substance and realness in this life is truly knowing who Jesus is. Not knowing about who Jesus is, which he spent his entire life learning about. He spent his entire life learning and studying the Old Testament, who God was. He's saying, I will trade all of that for the idea of having a true, open, honest, intimate relationship and personal relationship with who Jesus is. It's not about knowing about God, it's about truly knowing God. That's where the substance is, that's where the life is at. And Paul is saying, I will trade everything, I count everything else as a loss in comparison to truly knowing who Jesus is. That's one of the underlying themes that I wanna take into this new year. Going into the second part, it says forgetting what lies behind. Paul goes on in verse 12 of chapter 3 and he says that, not that I've already attained this or am already perfect. And so this really, this really stood out to me because for the longest time in my, in my walk in studying like the Bible and Paul's teachings and Paul's letters, I would always read something kind of out of pocket like, what we read at the very beginning where he seemed super prideful, where it's like, follow me as I follow Jesus. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna follow you. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow God. Like, who are you to say to follow you? I'm supposed to follow God. And as I studied and as I got older, I started realizing that Paul wasn't prideful. He was just confident. He wasn't cocky, he was, he was confident. He was so confident that he was living life the right way, that he was chasing God in such a right way. He was saying, hey, like, I don't really want you to follow me, but he's saying, if you are gonna follow me, do the things that I'm doing, 
because I'm so confident that if you follow me, you're gonna end up at the feet of Jesus. And so a reason that this meant so much to me when I was reading this is saying, not, not that I've already attained this or am perfect, and oftentimes when Paul would write, he would, he would write with such a, a lofty approach and such a, such a professionalism and a perfectionism that you would think that he was perfect, that you would think that he had it all together. And so right here, you're kind of peeling back the curtain and he's saying, hey, I haven't attained this. This, I am not perfect. I haven't, I'm not even coming close to perfection, but I'm pushing towards it. I'm chasing the upward calling of Jesus Christ, but I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together, but I'm trying my best. He's saying, I'm gonna push forward to the upward calling of Jesus Christ, and I'm gonna forget what lies behind me. I'm not saying I'm gonna forget people. I'm not gonna forget events, forget events in my life, but I am gonna forget the things that I don't need to be focusing on. I'm not gonna be focusing on things that are of earthly value, of earthly concern, of worries and anxieties that I don't need to be holding myself back. There's a verse in Hebrews which say, which which I, I love because it says, lay aside every weight and sin so that easily entangles us. And something that's so profound about that verse is that weights can be anything. It can be spending too much time on your phone. It can be friends. It can be watching too much TV. Guilty. But there's things that hold you back that aren't necessarily sins, but they're weights that so easily entangle us. And he's saying, I'm going to forget those things and I'm going to push with everything that I have towards the upward call of Jesus. I don't want to get to this, the end of this year and, say, and, and be in the exact same spot. I don't want to get to the end of this year and say, I could have tried harder. I didn't really push for the call on my life. I don't really feel like I'm at a closer spot in my relationship with Jesus. I want to forget the things that are behind me and I want to push with everything I have this year to the upward call that's on my life so that my gifts, talents, and abilities are growing, that my depth and relationship with God are growing, that I can get to the end of this year and I can look back on where I was and say, dang God, we've come so far. I don't want to be trying to get over the same mountains and hurdles that I've been trying to get over this entire year. Like I want to, I want to lay things aside. I want to push towards God with everything that I've got. I want to fulfill the calling that he has on my life. And I want to push towards perfection and being more Christ-like this year than I ever have before. Because that's where the fulfillment is. I want to be getting closer and more Christ-like each and every day. And really quick, just to end everything, you just remember the promise. I love at the very end of this chapter, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. It's so simple because it's a daily reminder. I really believe that reading this every single day will refocus your mind on what's really important. That you can sit there and you can forget the things that lie behind. That you have the power to lay aside the weight and the sins that have entangled you, have kept you suppressed, have kept you bound and held down for your entire life. You can lay those things aside and you can push with everything you have towards the calling of God. I also believe that it reminds you and it humbles you to let you know that everything in this world, all the knowledge, all the things, all the talents, abilities, and gifts that you have pale in comparison to the idea that you get to know the God of the universe, that you get to know intimately and personally who Jesus is in your life and what he wants to do and that he loves you. He wants to communicate with you and that the God of the universe wants to have a relationship with you because you are the object of his obsession. God is obsessed with you. Like, let that sink in. Won't you realize that the God of the universe is obsessed with you and he has a love for you that, will, that you can't pluck him, you can't pluck yourself out of his hand, it changes your perspective. And lastly, this isn't our home. Like our citizenship is in heaven. And I love that it's at the end because it closes with remembering what's to come. It closes with remembering what God has said, what he's gonna do because God is faithful and he's gonna see things through to completion. We do not serve a God of loose ends. We do not serve a God that doesn't come through on his promises. If he said something, he's going to do it. And he can only act by his word. If it's not in his word, if it's not of him and his character in this book, it is not God. And we serve a God who stands by what he says, and he will never leave you nor forsake you, that our citizenship is in heaven, that we have a calling that we need to fulfill, that he is with us wherever we go. And this is the stuff that... 
I want my new year to be marked by. I want this to be the setting and the backdrop of what my focus and my focal point is on this year. I want to push towards God with everything that I have this year. I want to give it my all. I don't want to get to the end of my life saying that I could have done more or I wish I did better. I want to get to the end of my life and God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did everything that I asked you to do. There was no stone unturned. There was no door unopened. You did everything. And I hope that's the same for you guys too. I'm excited for this new year. I think God's going to do some insane, miraculous things. I think we're going to see God move like we've never seen him before. But it takes people that are willing to lean in. It takes people that are willing to say, God, I, I, I trust this book. I trust everything you've said. I trust that you're going to come through on your promises. I trust that you're going to show up. I trust that you're here when I call on you. I trust that even when you're not speaking, even when I don't see you, even in these silent moments, that you are still there, that you still love me, that I'm still the object of your obsession. When we get people that truly believe in this word and we truly believe what God said, that he's going to do what he says he's going to do, and that there's nothing that he can't do, I believe we're going to see revival. I believe we're going to see people's lives changed like we've never seen before. But it takes you. It takes me. It takes all of us diving in, going deeper, and sacrificing because there is something far more, far greater, far better, and far more satisfying in this life if we're willing to push towards the upward calling that God has on our life. Let's pray. God, thank you so much just for your word. Thank you so much for speaking. Thank you so much for just the ability to live another year. So God, I just pray that you're with us. God, I pray that you're empowering us, that you're giving us everything that we need each and every day. God, I pray that you give us, that you stir up a fire within us to focus on you, to get with you, to understand and learn about you more. And God, I just pray that you're willing and open to receive to, to show us more of who you are. God, we thank you for everything that you've done and that you're going to do this year. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me and listening to this message. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it impacted you and, and gave you a new perspective on different things. And guys, we're doing some really cool things this year. And something that we always do to kind of start the year is we do a Daniel's fast. Some of us are going to be doing something a little bit differently, but for the vast majority of us, we typically do um, a Daniel's fast. And I don't know the specifications and the specifics off the top of my head. I typically have to look it up at the very end, at the very beginning of each year. Um, but basically, we're going to be doing a Daniel's fast. Look it up if you'd like to know. But it's basically a 21-day fast where we get rid of junk and that type of stuff and food. It's really about food. And we, we focus on God. And it's based off of a book in the Bible and a fast that Daniel did in the Bible. It's called the Daniel's Fast. Look it up. Uh, and we want to encourage you to do that with us. If not the Daniel's Fast, then something equivalent. And... Um, just so you guys know, we also meet every Tuesday on Zoom at 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. If you want the Zoom link, it is in the Jay Walker's bio for Instagram. So go there, get everything that you need, and we'll see you guys there. It's kind of a more um, focused and facilitated discussion off of this message. So if you listen to this message and you want to go deeper and you want a deeper understanding and you want community, make sure you're there on the Zoom call. But love you guys. See you guys later.